Hello and welcome back to part 2 of 4.1. Today we are going to look at the applications of rating and degree measure. Before we look at applications, the first thing we want to do is identify arc length. For a circle of radius r, we have a central angle theta that intercepts an arc of length s and it's given to us by s equals r theta, where theta is measured in radians. And this formula here was rearranged because before uh, we were given that theta was equal to s or the arc length divided by the radius. This is what the definition of a radian measure was. So we took this formula here, rearranged it, solved for s, and got s equals r theta. Now if 1 equals r from this formula here, then we really have s equals theta, or your radian measure of theta equals your arc length. And before we move on, the one key piece that I want to point out um, when we use this equation is that theta has to be measured in radians. I'm going to tell you right now that you will be given story problems where the angle is measured in degrees. That means you must convert your angle of degrees to radians before you can use this formula. Otherwise, it will not work out correctly. So let's go ahead and look at an example um, that uses this formula. It says a circle has a radius of 27 inches. We have to find the length of the arc intercepted by a central angle of 160 degrees. So essentially, we are looking for the length of the arc, which is S, and we know that s is equal to r times theta. As I mentioned on the previous slide, the key piece here is that theta is measured in radians. So the first thing we have to do is we have to take our 160 degrees and convert it to radians. And we're going to do that by taking pi radians and dividing that by 180 degrees. Our degrees are going to cancel and that's going to leave us with 8 pi divided by 9 radians. So now this equals theta, and I have an r value of 27 inches, so I know that s is going to equal 27 inches times 8 pi divided by 9, and this will give me, uh, let's see, 9 goes into 27, 3 times, 3 times 8, which will be 24 pi, or this is approximately equal to 75.4. In my unit, remember arc length, um, I'm looking for a length, so my unit then would be inches. Another application of radian and degree measure deals with linear and angular speeds. Now, if we have a particle that's moving at a constant speed along a circular arc of radius r, and if s is the length of the arc traveled in time t, then we have linear speed, which is denoted with a lowercase v, is s divided by t, and s is our arc length divided by our time. Then, if we have theta as an angle, which has to be in radians, so again, this is a very key piece, and it corresponds to the arc length s, then we have the angular speed, which is given by this little symbol that looks like a w, but it's really the Greek letter omega. Then we can find angular speed by taking omega and setting it equal to theta, the angle divided by time. And just because these two things can be kind of confusing, the one thing I want you to make note of, linear speed measures how fast the particle is moving. Angular speed measures how fast the angle is changing. So linear speed is how fast it's moving. Angular speed is how fast the angle is changing. Now, there is a relationship between the two of these. If you start out with the equation of arc length equals r times theta and we know that angular or I'm sorry linear speed v equals s divided by t 
Well, I can rewrite s as r theta because that was given up above. So linear speed is really equal to r divided by, or I'm sorry, r times theta divided by t. And if you think back to the previous slide, we were told that omega, or angular speed, was equal to theta divided by t, which is really this piece right here. So I can really rewrite linear speed v as r times omega. So the relationship between linear speed and angular speed is this equation right here. Now, if I need to, I can use any one of these equations along the way, um, depending on what's been given to me. So let's look at example six. It says the second hand of a clock is eight centimeters long, and we want to find the linear speed of the tip of that second hand as it passes around the clock's face. Now, we were given that linear speed, which was V, was equal to S divided by T. S is our arc length, and T was our time. So we have to identify, were we given an arc length, and were we given a time? We were not given a specific arc length, but we were given the fact that we have a second hand that is 8 centimeters long, so that would be a radius. And we know that it's going to go around the clock of a face, and we know that it takes 60 seconds to get around the, that uh, circumference of the circle or around the clock face. So if I take that piece of information, then I can say that S is equal to 2 pi r, and the 2 pi r is my uh, circumference of a circle, so this gives me 2 pi times my radius, which is 8 centimeters, and if I solve for that, I really have 16 pi, and my units are centimeters, so this is s, I'm going to have to come back to that later, then I need to find my time, and we know that time was equal to one minute, because that's how long it takes for the tip of this hand to go all the way around the outside, and one minute is really equal to 60 seconds. So now, if I want to find linear speed, or V, I can take my S value of 16 pi centimeters, and divide that by my time of 60 seconds. And when I plug that in my calculator, and I am going to plug in the pi, I get something that's approximately equal to 0 0.83, and it says 775, so I'm going to round that up to 838. And my units, then, are centimeters per second. So again, I had to find my arc length, S, based on the circumference of the clock face. Then I had to go and find my time that it takes to travel the circumference, which we were given, well, we weren't directly given, but we know it takes 60 seconds for the second hand to go around that clock. So using my arc length and time, I was able to find my linear speed. Example 7 says that the circular blade on a saw rotates at 2400 RPM which, for those of you that don't know, RPM is revolutions per minute, and if we write that out, we can write it as a fraction. So we have revolutions per minute. So we want to find the angular speed in radians per second, and then once we found that, we want to find when the blade of a, has a radius of 4 inches, we want to know what is the linear speed of a blade tip in inches per second. So for part A, I'm going to start out with what I know. I know that I'm given 2400 revolutions, and I'm going to write this as a fraction, per minute. Now, part A says to find the angular speed in radians per minute, or per second, sorry, so the first thing I can do is I can get my unit of time gone. And I know that I have one minute for every 60 seconds. So what's going to happen here is my minutes are going to cancel. So now I have revolutions per second. 
And then I have to think about my revolutions. Now, I know that one revolution or one full rotation of that blade saw is really equal to 2 pi radians. And I have 2 pi radians for every one revolution. So based upon that information, my revolutions are now going to cancel. And I'm left with radians and seconds, which is exactly what I want to have right here. And if you remember, angular speed, which is omega, is really equal to theta divided by t. Well, radians is a measure of theta. Seconds is a measure of time. So this is all the work that I really have to do. So 2400 times 2 divided by 60 is going to give me 80. And I still have the pi. And this then is going to be radians per minute. So part A now is complete. Now for part B, we have to find the linear speed when the radius is 4. So linear speed is equal to V. And V we knew was equal to S divided by T. Well, in this case, S is really equal to R theta because I am given a radius of 4, so I know I have to have R in there somewhere. So I really have R theta divided by T. And R theta, or I'm sorry, theta divided by T was really omega or our angular speed. So I can really use that V equals omega or R times omega. So my radius is 4 inches times my omega, which I just found in part A. And that was 80 pi radians per minute, or I'm sorry, per second. And when we simplify this, we end up with 4 times 80 pi is going to give me somewhere around 1,005. That would be inches per second. And that would be my linear speed. And the last thing we're going to look at today is the area of a sector of a circle. Now, a sector of a circle is the region that's bounded by two radii of the circle and their intercepted arc. So if we have a circle, let's just draw one right here, and we have two radii like this, and we're going to pretend that this is our central angle, then the sector is going to be this shaded in area there. It's bound by the two radius right here and here, and that arc right there, and then it'll be everything in between. Now we can calculate the area of that sector by A equals 1 half R squared theta. And again, theta is measured in radians. This is a very important formula that you must know as it will not be given to you on a test or a quiz. So example A is a prime example of a case where you'd find the area of a sector. It says a sprinkler on a golf course is set to spray water over a distance of 75 feet and it rotates through an angle of 135 degrees. We want to find the area of the fairway that is watered by the sprinkler. So, area of a sector, because it's not a full 360 degree circle, is going to be given by 1 half r squared times theta. Theta is measured in radians, so I have to take my 135 degrees convert it to radians by going pi radians for every 180 degrees. My degrees are going to cancel and I'm left with 3 pi over 4 radians. So now when I go and I plug into my formula I have 1 half. My radius is 75 feet and then I have 3 pi over 4 radians, and when I multiply all of this together, I get, oops, and I did forget to square my radius there. So when I multiply this together on my calculator, I get 6,626.8 square feet.
<laughs> and this concludes our last example. And now it's time for our college fun fact of the week. Today's fun fact was courtesy of CBSNews.com, and the article was titled, Facts You Didn't Know About College Freshmen. And it says 76% of freshmen were accepted into their number one college choice. And I believe this was based on 2012 data. 55% of the students took at least one AP course while in high school. Fewer incoming students received grants or scholarships, um, and they came in with numbers at 69.5% uh, versus 73.4% in 2010. So in two years, that percentage dropped. Only 26.8% of the 2012 freshmen received $10,000 or more versus 29.2% in 2010. I cannot stress to you the importance of filling out every single application that you can for scholarships. Even if it's only $200, if it takes you one hour to fill that application out, $200 an hour, is an ex that's a really good rate. Um, so fill them out if they're $100, $200, $300. You're not always going to get the $10,000 scholarships. Fill everything out that you can. And something that's also important to do is to fill out that FAFSA form. Your FAFSA form will enable you to get um, loans that are, they're called subsidized loans, where the government will pay the interest while you are in school. That's a really good deal. You can also apply for unsubsidized loans where you have to pay the interest, but you don't have to pay those loans until six months after you graduate. Every little bit helps. If you can't get scholarships, those types of loans are good loans to get. Um, and then the last fun fact says that 42% of freshmen expect to earn a master's degree. Um, there's nothing wrong with setting a goal early on as a freshman and um, working towards that goal. If you have any questions on this stuff, please, please, please do not hesitate to ask myself or Mrs. Hempton or anybody else for help. I myself had my first year in college at $21,000 paid for. I can help you with the scholarship process if you need it. So on that note, I hope you have a good night and I will see you in class.